So uh, welcome to our last session. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Um, so uh, we'll continue showcasing outcomes, and I think we've got a, a great set of four, four speakers, very diverse projects. Um, so I'll invite Brett Tucker from Mount Stromlo Observatory to um, you know, uh, tell us about his project. Thanks, Brett. Uh, great. Uh, so I'll, I'll switch focus to a bit of astronomy uh, uh, and how we teamed up with a, a TV show uh, to do citizen science. Um, and one of the interesting things that this turned into, uh, well, firstly, the search for planet nine isn't in Hebrew. Um, that, that, that seems simple, but it's not. Uh, you know, and this citizen science project became quite interesting. You know, we were hearing we hear about fake news and, you know, and conspiracy theories, which is, well, I would like to call it conspiracy theories more of a you know, because when you hear theory, right, you, you want to the emphasis of scientific theory, and then this just confuses that nomenclature. It's really scientific fruitcake. Uh, it's a bit nutty, hard to digest, you never want it. Um, and it's a way of engaging people directly into something they may or may not know of, and allowing them to the process to show why it is completely made up. But at the same time, it has a big, actually, scientific impact and goal. Uh, you know, and I randomly, a few days ago, just typed in Nibiru, uh, and of course, the Pope was covering it up. Um, but it even went into, you know, this is from the Washington Post, it's not, you know, it's an actual serious media outlet that's talking about it. And so it was a way of engaging in this, um, but also inviting the people uh, into this public space. Um, and astronomy tends to be different from the other sciences in that you don't get yelled at, right? You know, I, I applaud all the people who hate the environment because you get a lot of people who hate it. No, I, I'm not being facetious, right? I mean, that's the world we live in. I can say anything in astronomy and people are like, oh. <laughs> it's great. And, right, and it's true because I can test this. When we launched this project, for about the first week, I got three to five emails per hour saying, hey, good job, someone's trying to actually do this. I'm glad the scientists is actually looking to do it. I replied to every single email. And I explained to them what we were doing, how it was different, and if they didn't believe me, to go look at the data for themselves and understand it. And not one of them yelled at me. Some didn't reply, some said thank you, some sent me links to YouTube videos I didn't watch. But it ended up being a unique opportunity of educating people and engaging with people. So a, a little bit about what's going on. Uh, I like this schematic of the solar system, the planets, and distances that are relative to the scale. Uh, and Planet 9, there's a bit of it that goes back to Pluto. Uh, and when people think, why is Pluto not a planet? Uh, yes, it is small, but it has nothing to do with its size. Um, it's all about the orbit. Um, and it's because Pluto, the, the, the original planet 9, uh, which actually in New Mexico is still technically a planet in New Mexico, because the New Mexico State Legislature passed it overall. They didn't believe the astronomers because it's still in New Mexico. They'll go to New Mexico. Um, you know, Pluto is actually quite a dynamic dwarf planet. Um, this is a real image from New Horizons. You can see there's actually an atmosphere, there's fog. Uh, there's clouds, there's mountains. It has nothing to do with the quality of what the object is. It's all about the orbits. Uh, and what was realized was that the behavior of Pluto was different from the other eight objects. Uh, and this was spurred by the discovery of theories. Um, so to discover Mike Brown, when he discovered this, his Twitter handle is called Pluto Killer, um, realized that the dynamics of these things on the outside are different than the things on the inside. They don't control the rover, they're not in a stable orbit, they're not in a controlled physical balance essentially in a place in the solar system, and therefore they're different than the other eight things um, inside. Those are the four inner planets plus the, the larger outer planets. And, and, and that was it. This is the whole principle. It has nothing to do with what that object is. You know, and I would consider Pluto more a planet in some ways than Mercury because of the atmosphere, because of the system that it is. But by our definition, it is not a planet, it's a dwarf planet. And it's also not alone. There's at least 10 other dwarf planets outside in the other solar system. 
Um, there's potentially another up to 800 dwarf planets in our solar system that have not been discovered. Um, you know, and some are bigger than Pluto, some have moons. Um, they're quite dynamic. And, it, and it's a big opportunity for exploration and allowing people into something that people genuinely care about. Now, when you start looking at some of these dwarf planets, you start to notice something. And this is actually where this theory of Planet Nine comes in. So, as I said, Planet Nine is not Libru. And the reason being the original Libru hoax is that it's a dwarf star. And then when this calculation came out that there could be a dwarf planet, of course, they just migrated to it being a planet. Um, and when you plot some of these dwarf planets, you notice something. So here are the other eight planets right there in our solar system. And a number of these things, because they're great names, you notice something. That firstly, their orbits are egg-shaped, they're not circular, and they're all on this side of the solar system. And that is not an artistic representation, that is their actual dynamics of their orbits. So what we mean is that you have one side of the solar system that is lopsided. So you have a whole lot of mass on one side pulling the solar system in one direction. But our solar system is what we call gravitationally stable. It's not moving, it's not shifting. The orbits of the other planets aren't changing. And so the only way to do gravity that that works if there's something else with the same amount of mass on this side. Now, you could say that there's just a whole bunch of dwarf planets on that side that we don't know of, but the natural easiest solution is that there's just one object there. Now, there could be multiple. There's no reason there couldn't. But there's no way so far of getting multiple small things out here that both change the orbit directionally and also the shape of their orbit. And that's why Planet Nine exists. The theory, anyway. There's another interesting fact that we start to realize with this. When we look at planets around other stars, what we call exoplanets, you notice something. There's a lot of Earths. There's a lot of Neptunes and Jupiter type things. And there's this category called super Earths. And there are things that are larger than our Earth. So if you look at the four inner planets, of the four inner planets of Earth is largest. So these are about sometimes twice the size of Earth. But they're not quite the size of Neptune's or Jupiter's, and not the composition of Jupiter's. And they make up nearly 20% of all other planets in our galaxy. But we don't have these. So are we unique? Or have we missed something? And so uh, early uh, 2000, or mid-2006, 2006, 2016 rather, uh, Mike Brown, Pluto killer, uh, and one of his postdocs, uh, made his calculation to try and explain these, these dwarf planets. And they came up with a model of where a thing could exist. Uh, this looks complicated, it's not, it's just numbers. Uh, so this is kind of the position of the sky, so here's the southern hemisphere. This is how far away it is. So 1 AU is 1 times the distance the Earth is from the sun. Uh, Pluto is here, so it's much further than Pluto. It's really faint. So uh, it's about uh, a million times fainter than what you can see in Pluto. But it's moving really slow. So it's a very far away thing that is slowly moving through the sky. That's why it hasn't been found. OK, you can believe that. Now the question is, how do you find it? You have something that takes a long time. One orbit, one movement around the sun of this thing takes 10 to 20,000 Earth years. So it's long. It's fainter, so you can't see it with your naked eye, and you need some of the biggest cells in the world to see it, and you have to look for a long time. And so it's kind of like trying to find, it's not even like a needle in a haystack, it's a needle in a stack of needles, but someone put it in Elon Musk's car and shot it to Mars, you don't know where it's going. Because you, you just don't even know what you're looking for because the parameter space is so huge. And so it could be anywhere in the sky, at any time, any shape, any brightness, any size. So it's a theory, and that's it, all it is, essentially. So we said, hey, we have an interesting thing. We built a new telescope that's actually covered all of this area. And we can literally look through every single image and see if it's there. But that would take a lot of time. So we teamed up with Brian Fox. Teaming up is for not only the Citizen Science Project, 
But what the television show allows us to reach a wide range of audiences that didn't normally engage with it. In fact, we know from the surveys and the respondents, about 85% have never done a citizen science project. 70% uh, didn't work generally interested in astronomy. Uh, and of the people that participated, um, most of them actually kept up and did it for the whole few days. I'll explain why I'm saying today in a second. So we ran last year, this was on the BBC and the ABC, the ABC had a separate project um, for finding planets around other stars. We focus on Planet 9 with the BBC. Um, and so the traditional way you would try and find something is this. So planet. Did you see it? I'm not kidding. There's something there. Oh, go back. See it moving? That's the traditional way of astronomy we think we should do these things. You take a few images, you blink them, so to speak, to see it move. Now, it's kind of abstract to find. Can anyone see a series of colored dots in one of these images? Yeah, you saw it right there. That's a thousand times bigger than that. But you saw it a lot further. Why? Because our eyes adapt to see color differences. So that is a dwarf planet, a hundred times smaller than Pluto. It was only discovered two years ago, but we've done this technique, we discovered it a lot quicker. So not only in the process of doing this, we discovered an entire new technique. So we got really good at finding things. So in uh, two and a half days, we had 4 million classifications. We had 200,000 participants. We went through what would have taken someone eight years in two and a half days. And so we got good at finding quickly where it was not. That's Neptune. These green areas are all just planets not. And then another view of the solar system, that's not the point. But if you look back at this parameter space, in two and a half days, we ruled out all of those areas. But we had all the other classifications to go through. We've ruled that out. We have discovered something new. Don't know what it is. It's this object. And I'll just end here because it's, we're in the process. <coughs> because of the people who participated so quickly, by the time we're finished with the data in a couple months, we will know if plan nine exists. And we will actually have an answer to something that people have been wondering um, for thousands of years. We will know because 200,000 people participate in a television show. So, there also might be another one, but I will leave it there.